Good evening. My name is Dean Peachy. It's my pleasure to serve as Executive Director of the University of Winnipeg Global College and to welcome you to our program tonight. This week at the University of Winnipeg, we've been honored to have Dr. Rama Mani on campus teaching a special intensive course on human rights, healing, and the human spirit a course about restoring justice after atrocity. Tonight's program is in fact the final class session of this course. And we're so pleased to partner with the Winnipeg Art Gallery in opening this event to the general public. So everybody, welcome to class. Thank you for joining us. The test will be next week or perhaps in the rest of your lives, I'm not sure. Tonight's theme is War, Women, and the Human Spirit. Ramamani will bring to our ears the voices of women from around the world, coupled with images and music from various partners. We're very delighted to have the Bahatis with us tonight, <clears throat> as well as Mira Black providing music. And the, the performance and the music will be followed by, I think, an engaged and engaging conversation among Ramamani with Regina King and Mary Lou McFedrin. Now, Dr. Mani is one of the most versatile individuals I know. Scholar, poet, performer, tireless activist and advocate. The work that she does is infused with her 25 years of experience as a visionary strategic actor in peace and security. Rama is a counselor in the World Future Council, a senior research associate at the University Oxford Center for International Studies. Some of her previous positions include serving as the executive director of the International Center for Ethnic Studies in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and as the Africa Strategy Manager for Ox Oxfam, Great Britain, which involved living and working in war zones across the continent. She's written books and articles on transitional justice and the responsibility to protect. And in 2013, the University of Marburg awarded Ramamani the Peter Becker Pri Peace Prize, the most valuable award for peace and conflict studies in Germany for the combined impact of her scholarship and her engagement in activism. She is also an academic, has a PhD in political science from a little known place called Cambridge University. She grew up in India and now lives in France. To begin our program tonight, we will begin with a <clears throat> blessing and a song by John and Beatrice Fox. They are OG Cree sun dancers from Northern Ontario who now live in Winnipeg. John is a student at the University of Winnipeg in conflict resolution studies. Welcome John and Beatrice. Hello? Yeah, there it is. I want to start off by uh, um, thanking Dean for inviting me to come up and sing, both me and my wife. I also want to thank, um, this ain't my territory, and I think it's very important to always acknowledge the people, um, the Aboriginals that, um, that live in this area. And, uh, um, we don't say that it belongs to us. Uh, we were taught that we're only caretakers. I want to start off by saying uh, a little prayer. Um, and then me and my wife are going to sing a song. Um, for those of you that can, and I stress that, if you're having a hard time to stand up, don't. But those of you that can't, can you please stand up? Um, 
Manudada, Ningak Shiba students gas, Meganak do Tamak, Wabanuk Shawanuk Pakshmuk Kiwednuk, Namavaski, Kichizu Gai Taik, Nam Shumak Nokma, Kichmanatu, and ask Man Mab Mat Sungam in Shagaki, Vyashishak, Nipigega Amagak, Kaknegego Noj Machu Hagim in Shak, Nam Shumus Peace, Nokmus Tipki Peace, Wajakshak. Kaknegonga in Newton, Nepeka Gabaksik, Kunga Gabaksik, Minish Nakumnan, Web Matsung, Kajmun Minsha Migwach. Um, without further ado, we're going to ask the spirits of all directions to come join us in this festival. This what we're trying to do here today. I thank you for coming here. Truly, this lady has achieved the honor to teach what she teaches today. And I thought of a song that we're for this is about women for my wife to sing. But we both decided to sing a song where we both sing for that is our teaching. Ego se. Good evening. It is such an honor for me to be here in Winnipeg, which has this unique gift 
of having such a rich First Nation community, such a diverse ethnic community of people who are in these prairies and still spread out and radiate around the world, and such a welcoming community for refugees and immigrants from around the world. For me, this week since I arrived has been one of discovering that Winnipeg is synonymous with wish fulfillment, because literally every wish that I had for this evening has come true day upon day. The first one that I'd expressed to Dean Peachy was it would mean a lot to me coming here to have the ceremony, the, the event opened with this blessing and song and drums by First Nation people from here. The fact, as you just shared, that you came as a couple and sang and played together and consecrated the space together makes it even more beautiful. I was also very fortunate in my class, which was extremely enriching for me, that I had two members, both grandparents, one grandfather and one grandmother of the indigenous community. And that deeply enriched the experience for all of us. My first piece is dedicated to the First Nations people of Canada for having preserved their extraordinary wisdom, their compassionate earth wisdom, despite all of the subjugations, expropriations of the years. Um, and I will start with that in a minute. I also want to explain to you that since the programs were printed, um, I've had the great fortune, as I said, this has been my week of wish, wish fulfillment. So the first wish which was fulfilled is having, okay, maybe we take one second so everyone could just check their mobile phones and put them on silent. I've realized that's now become standard at every event to uh, at some point have to make that announcement. So the first one has just been fulfilled. The second one, which has led to two great enhancements of our program, is I always love it wherever I go to meet local musicians. So what better than meeting the Native American musicians? On Wednesday, um, one of our students shared that there would be a, a commemoration in the legislature with your MLAs honoring, commemorating the invisible genocide in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And at that very moving ceremony, I met these four extraordinarily beautiful women who are also sisters, who've been refugees from the DRC in Uganda and arrived here just a year ago. So the Bahati sisters have enhanced our program and will uh, be singing for us today. And last night, less than 24 hours ago, I visited your gas station theater and for, a, for the festival of the spoken word. And there I met an extraordinary, globally renowned, but Winnipeg born uh, musician, Mira Black, who many of you I know already know and love. And I'm very honored that she too, like the Bahatis, agreed to join us. So what could be better than to have live music peppering our evening instead of the recorded music that I had uh, earlier proposed of my friends, uh, my Cameroonian friends. So with that, I want to start with the first piece, which is called The Truce of the First People, uh, and is dedicated to the indigenous of Canada, but to indigenous people around the world. Because around the world, including in my country, indigenous people are still under siege, still being expropriated, still being dispossessed. May they learn and be inspired by the Canadian indigenous. We have seen the children rebirthed, stolen, and shot before our eyes. We have seen our full-grown sons, emasculated in their prime, 
We have seen our daughter sullied. Our men maimed and tortured for life. We have seen our homes and villages burnt, our fields laid to waste, our shrines shattered, our sweet, sweet songs unsung. We have seen the passing of our old ways. And we have cursed you, our merciless miscreants. This is true. But we come here today to face you, asking not for vengeance or justice even, but simply for a truth. Give us a chance to survive and escape extinction. One day, what you have done will weigh heavily upon your spirits. Then you will seek us out to ask for forgiveness. If we or our progeny no longer live, you will wander eternally in the desert of guilt, unable to solace yourselves. So, take what you must, but leave us. Leave us our patch of land, burnt by your firing sticks, desecrated by your digging machines. She is still our mother. She is holy in our regard. Empty-handed, we will blow life into her once more with our spirits. And when you or your children come back here one day asking for redemption, we will welcome you in. So at last, cycle of violence can end. It is already today the 20th anniversary of the genocide in Rwanda. While the genocide was unfolding, I was working for an international commission called the Commission on Global Governance, uh, made up of global leaders trying to find ways to prevent genocides or to know how to act and intervene humanitarianly when they happened. But a few years later, when the, the invisible genocide in the Democratic Republic of Congo hit the world stage, I was working in the Horn of Africa as an advisor on conflict. And we luckily were alerted by our local staff in the Congo to what was happening. And in that one year, in the year between 2000 and 2001, we thought that we had moved heaven and earth because four million people had already died, and that was simply too much. And despite all the efforts we made then, raising the case with the UN Security Council, trying to get the, the, secure, the UN peacekeeping force increased, bringing attention to the war economies and the rapes of women, now seven million have died in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So there are the genocides we have noticed and tried to prevent or intervene in. There are all the genocides we've turned away from or, or decided not to name. And every year, the genocidaires perfect their techniques. The next piece is called the Manual of Instruction of Genocidaires.
manual of instruction for genocidaires. Every genocide begins with a policy of systematic cultural ethnocide. We genocidaires everywhere in the world know this well. This is our mode d'emploi, our manual of instructions. We don't expect people to kill people so easily, especially those they know and love. So we prepare them step by step. We strip away their humanity layer by layer until they become our obedient killing machines. This is how we do it. We start by choking to death their culture. We rubbish the values they cherish. We erode the ethics that ennoble them. We outlaw the traditions that make them know who they are. We break down the timeless taboos of do's and don'ts that preserve them from harm for centuries. Next. We make their neighbors seem like suspicious strangers. We treat what is familiar as alien. We render subtle differences stark. We divide families and friends based on demarcations we invented last night. Then we inscribe them on identity cards and stamp them into law. Oh, we watch with satisfaction as the glaze of hatred covers the spark of solidarity in our citizens' eyes. Now, we are almost ready. A false rumor dressed up as fact. A radio broadcast potent with insinuation. An incendiary that's all it takes. The match is lit. We stand back and watch as they rush forward to do our dirty work. The second part of this evening is dedicated to women who face all these different kinds of wars to start and set us in the tone of women, victims, and no longer victims of war. I call upon the Bahati sisters from the Democratic Republic of Congo to sing us their first piece. Welcome. Thank you. We are so blessed to be here this evening. We are called the Baharis, and uh, we are from Congo. We spent 10 years in Uganda as refugees before arriving in Winnipeg. We are children of victim of war, and everything Rama said here have been happening in our country and all over the world, and as girls, women, we understand the pain that women go through and that each and every one go through. Our mission is to stand for women and for the right of children and to fight and to bring awareness to those women and children that are going through the same situation that we went through. And today my call is for you and me. Jo let's join Rama. Let's join the Baha'is. Let's put ourselves in the situation that women go through. And let's be the voice of change. We're going to sing a song, an a cappella, before going so far. We're going to sing a song that says, I'm a strong woman, before we go to the song called Love Your Loss. 
it's going to be a short song, but this song is dedicated to all the women that have been standing for other women out there in the world. This song is dedicated to you. I'm a strong woman, bold woman. I'm a wise woman. I'm a let everybody get to know that I'm a strong woman, bold woman, wise woman. I'm a let everybody get to know that. Empowered woman, beautiful woman, beautiful woman, phenomenal woman. Phenomenal woman. Yeah. I'ma let everybody get to know that. We're gonna sing a song called Love You Lance. <laughs> this song is a song that's come from the heart. And, it, and we dedicated it to the Pansy Foundation. And last week, we donated the money from the, our events that went to the Pansy Hospital, a hospital that helped women that have been sexually abused and treat them. We felt that we are part of that and we should be involved. So this song says, Arrêtons la violence, stop the war, stop the killing and stop the sexual violence. We hope it's gonna be part of you too. Arrêtons l'assassinat, arrêtons la guerre, stoppons la violence, cherchons la paix avec tous. Arrêtons l'assassinat, arrêtons la guerre, stoppons la violence, préservons l'avenir du demain. Yes, you can play it. En Afrique, arrêtons la violence, s'il vous plaît. Arrêtons la violence. Droits de femmes bafoués, les hommes tués, les femmes violées, le pays dévasté. Droits de femmes bafoués, les hommes tués, les femmes violées, le pays dévasté. Et les enfants dans des Cherchons la paix avec tous Arrêtons l'assassinat Arrêtons la guerre Stoppons la violence Préservons l'avenir du demain Par le monde des droits des femmes Où êtes-vous Où êtes-vous Nous avons droit à la vie les mains des droits de l'homme Où êtes-vous, où êtes-vous Nous avons droit à la vie Et dans ce monde Cherchons la peine et tout Arrêtons l'assassinat L'assassinat Arrêtons la guerre La violence La guerre Cherchons la paix avec tout Arrêtons L'assassinat, arrêtons la guerre, la violence, préservons l'avenir du demain. Arrêtons l'assassinat, arrêtons la guerre, la guerre, cherchons la paix avec tous. Arrêtons l'assassinat, arrêtons la guerre, la violence. Préservons la venue du demain. Oh 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 oh
money too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's have your money too. Oh, 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 let's have your money too. Oh, 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 yeah. Let's all be one. Let's have your money too. Oh, 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 let's have your money. Let's all be one. Let's let let a money. Let's have your money. Ooh, let's have your money. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I decided in this section, which is on women in war, quite consciously not to include a piece which shares the extraordinary brutalities that women in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in every conflict around the world are facing, the sexual violence, which has become an epidemic. But I want us as we enjoy the music of these uh, sisters, to just hold in our hearts and minds all those wounded women who have been sexually violated. I start my first piece here in Palestine with Yusra. I chose her because there are some women, as we shall meet this evening, who have made that long journey from suffering to strength. But there are many who are still caught in the dark, dark tunnel of suffering. And I want to first honor and stand in solidarity as we all do with them. I chose Yusra from Palestine, who I met last December when I was there, because she was born in 1967 like me, into a very modest family like mine. But she was born the year of occupation and her entire life has been punctuated by that experience. I am Yusra from Jericho. When I was very small, they arrested my father and then all my brothers, one by one. My mother would take me to jail to visit them. Each time, the long waits, the body searches, the humiliation, just for a glimpse of our loved ones. When I was 13, my mother married me off because there was no man left in the family to protect me from the soldiers who kept invading our privacy. Till then, I always came first, not just in my class, in the whole school. I, I thought I would be the first in my family to go to university. What did I know about marriage and children? when I was just a child myself. Somehow, life went on with all the struggles. Until the day they arrested my son. At first, 
We didn't know what had happened to him. He, he was only 20. I, I prayed somehow he would stay safe till he could start university. For two months, I just, I went everywhere. I asked everyone, the police, the, the, the soldiers at checkpoints, the Red Cross, for news, any news of my son. They would tell me nothing. It was as if history had returned. No, it had never stopped. I felt as if the roof of my house had collapsed on my head. Tell you this, when they kill a, a mother's child, it's as if they cut a piece of her with a kitchen knife. This is not normal. None of our women's stories is normal. We women want this war to end. Yusra's, Yusra's story is typical of Palestine, and yet it is an echo of the story of women in so many parts of the world. And yet, for some women, the love of their beloved ones and their loss has been a source of strength, a source in the quest for justice and reparations. So we travel from Palestine to Peru, to meet Mama Angelica. Eighteenth July, nineteen eighty three. That was the day they took me, Iho, my son. Archimedes was only eighteen. That very day, I started my protest outside the Casa Capito the army fortress, demanding that they return my innocent boy. Other women started collecting there. I saw them, their bellies empty with too much mourning and too little food. I would bring my thermos of coffee and some biscuits, and I would hold them while they wept and shared their story. One day I said, we must organize. That was how we formed ANFASEP. It is the National Association of the Families of the Disappeared, Kidnapped, and Detained. It helped us to come together in this way, to share our stories, to understand the patterns of violence in this dirty war where we, the Quechua, the indigenous are the victims because we are poor and powerless. We've waited 41 years. The president came from the capital here to Ayacucho to meet us. He shook my hand. He said, we will give you reparations. He said, we will build you a museum of memory. Yes. He established a commission for truth and reconciliation. But still, we are waiting empty-handed. 
our 7,800 loved ones have not been found, not been returned. We built our own museum of memory when they wouldn't build it for us. Here we honor our departed. We pray that they might find in that other realm the peace they could never find here on earth. I am 85, and till my dying breath, I will keep on asking for reparations for our lost ones. I will keep on supporting my sisters, my daughters, in this quest. But yes, even if we have not found our peace, I am glad that women come from far off places they share their suffering and our strength and our unity supports them and inspires them to go on. We travel next to Somalia. Our images of Somalia are of women trapped in a violent, patriarchal society with little room for maneuver. I found something quite different when I went first in June of 2000, I believe it was, to the Somali region of Wajir and met the women of Wajir. And when I heard their story of how they had negotiated peace with their men, I was so impressed that I took a delegation of these elderly women with me to a summit of African leaders who was negotiating a treaty to end gun violence and wars in Africa. What is fascinating is what the Wajir women did is similar to what the women of Somalia did in creating the sixth clan and having their voices heard in the peace that is slowly, very slowly coming to that land. I dedicate this piece to Deka Ibrahim Abdi of Wajir, who died tragically a couple of years ago after winning the alternative Nobel Peace Prize. You may know that so far only 15 women have won the Nobel Peace Prize. However, we have identified at least 1,000 women like Deka, like Asha Heji Elmi, who created the Sixth Clan in Somalia, who richly deserve the Nobel Peace Prize and yet have not been awarded it. It was like this. The venom of violence had stung our men. Their Kalashnikovs became dearer to them than us, their women, or their own lives. We lived in torment. Our nights and days punctuated with gunshots. The air of our village shredded with war cries and lamentations for lost ones. One day we had had enough. We got together, all the women, and we met in secret and pondered long and hard what must be done. Finally, Um Rahim, the oldest woman of our clan, said, we are ready. She summoned the Shura Council of Elders. Never before had a woman sat with the Shura members Never before had a woman spoken face to face with the men. We went together. We saw them there, the men, the elders, the boys, clutching their guns like toys. 
when the Shura leader raised his hand for Um Rahim to speak, she spoke through her veil. Bowing her head, she said, respected men folk, we women have always obeyed your will. But now, our hearts and spirits will not let us follow you in this folly. We cannot sit still while our past and our future is in flames. Today, we ask you to heed us. These are our three conditions. First, we ask that our village be declared a zone of peace. We ask that no man bring his gun into his home or into the marketplace. Just as we <coughs> remove our shoes when we enter the mosque, we ask you to keep your guns in a sequestered place. Second, we ask you to meet with the members of the, far, the four other clans. But we ask that you go to this meeting not thinking of vengeance, but only of the future of our children. Third, we ask you to accept us, the women, as members of the Shura and to consult us in your decision making. We repudiate our clan allegiances. Our only allegiance is to the future and the welfare of our community and our land. We ask you to consider our condition, but we also tell you there will be consequences if you do not heed us. We women will go on strike, all of us, in the fields and pastures, in the marketplaces, in the kitchens, and in bed. An astonished hush followed. Then a man screamed, those witches, we must teach them a lesson. The Shura leader raised his hand and silence fell. He stared stonily into the distance. Then he said, Om Rahim. You have reminded us of our code of honor. You have shamed us into remembering what we must be. We accept your conditions. We honor our women and accept you as our sixth clan. Without you, our women, our keepers of our traditions and our future, what are we but unconceived dust? And so it was. From that time, the men and women of our village worked together, and we went far and wide with our message. And yes, slowly, slowly, peace came to our ancient desert land. As I said, last night, I had the great honor of meeting a globally renowned, soul-stirring musician, Mira Black of Winnipeg. Welcome, Mira. Thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. What, what better way for us to tap into the next section of our program, Kindling the Human Spirit. I was a shy and lonely girl With the heavens in my eyes And as I walked along the lane I heard the echoes of her cries I cannot fight 
I cannot a warrior be. It's not my nature, nor my teaching. It is the woman who in me. I was a lost and angry youth. There were no tears in my eyes. I saw no justice in my world. Only the echoes of her cries. I cannot fight. I cannot a warrior be. It's not my nature nor my teaching. It is the woman who in me. I am an older woman now, and I will heed my own cries, and I will a fierce warrior be till not another woman dies I can and will fight I can and will a warrior be it is my nature and my duty it is the sisterhood in me. Kim Berlick, Namaste Rami. Thank you. What Mira reminds us of is that in conflict, there is no black and white, no bad and good, no irredeemably evil and pure, pure. In every conflict on both sides, we find those who are striving to rekindle the human spirit, striving to build bridges across the divides. We'll travel now to Palestine. I had mentioned to you that last December I traveled with my dear friend Zahira Kamal, who was the first minister for women's affairs of Palestine. The, the day before we left Amman to travel to uh, Jerusalem and then from there to several cities in Palestine, I met Simon, a passionate advocate for peace and especially for a role for women in peace processes. So we will go across and meet both Simon, the Jewish peace activist, and Rauda in Bethlehem, a Palestinian who has restored hope to the women of her country. I'm Simone. My parents were immigrants from Eastern Europe. They survived the Holocaust and gave birth to me in 1948. Yes, I'm as old as Israel. My husband was 10 when, they saw the, when he saw the Nazis arrest his mother just in front of their family home. She died in Auschwitz. He survived and joined the resistance at the age of 15. It was our defiance of injustice that united us. That and our faith in humanity. We believed that Judaism, an open, secular Judaism, could unite people of all backgrounds. We thought that Israel could be a country of refuge for all the suffering. 
So when I became the president of the Jewish Community Center in Brussels, I did everything I could. I used politics and culture to build bridges between Israel and Palestine. One day, in the midst of all our peace work, I asked, but where are the women? My colleagues laughed politely and looked away, but I was determined. I organized the first meeting of 20 Palestinian women leaders with 20 Israeli women leaders. Never before had they met. This was the height of the first Intifada. The situation was tense. For two days, we made no progress as the women on the Israeli side talked about their terror of the terrorists of, of the Palestinian side, while the women on the Palestinian sh side shared their suffering under the occupation. Then one day, a young Palestinian said, we have heard enough of each other's sufferings, but we have come here because we are all women and we know this war cannot continue like this. That united us. That ignited us to find a way out of our morass. So we worked hard and came up with a seven-point plan, adopted a declaration, and we held hands in a spirit of euphoria and optimism and sang, we shall overcome. For 20 years, despite all the odds, we kept on meeting. Wherever we could, whenever we could, we traveled to different countries to meet with women there to tell them if we could become friends, if we could work together across enemy lines, so could they. <sighs> we did not succeed. Our proposals were good, but they did not please the power brokers. Their peace plan was weak and fell to pieces. As walls of division rose, it became impossible for the women to meet. Five years have passed since then. The future looks bleak, but I have not given up. What I have learned that without the spirit of women, there will be no lasting peace. I'm Rauda. I was born in 1948, yes, the year we lost our liberty. But I drank the milk of freedom the moment I came out of my mother's breast. At the age of 18, I made my first Molotov cocktail, except I burnt my face instead. After eight years in jail, I was released in a prisoner's exchange, like my husband. He had spent 15 years as their captive. His body was limp with torture. But his spirit, his spirit was still alive with the thirst for freedom which birthed our love. So we defied his Muslim father and my Christian mother and we married and we never looked back as we fled from one hiding place to another with our clandestine posters and our pamphlets escaping the clutches of our occupiers. After the second Intifada, I looked around at the shards of broken lives scattered everywhere. And I asked, who will heal these wounded women? Who will lead them on the path from suffering to wisdom? Who? 
I knew I would. That's what I do now. I hold these women in the depth of their despair. Just hold them until they feel their inner strength. Where can we turn for hope? when there is still such bleakness, so many conflicts as yet unresolved and seemingly unresolvable, and as new crises emerge every day. We turn to our youth for hope. I call upon the Bahati sisters again to perform one more song for us, to restore in us a sense of hope in the future. Uh, the song that we're going to sing right now, we're going to sing a song called There Is Hope. This song is a song that really means a lot to us. And uh, it's a song that we're dedicating to all the countries in the world that have been going through war and the women that have been going through sexual violence. We just send this prayer and to encourage them, to tell them that there is hope. No matter how hard life can be. Tears flowing from my eyes in the rain. I feel I've lost everything. I can make it on my own. The mountain so high. The river so wide, nobody to live known. I feel I'm alone. There is hope, hope is there for you. Tomorrow's gonna be bright, just stand as a champion. Don't let the world shake you. Stand for my strong, I say There is hope, hope is that for you There is hope, hope is that for you Tomorrow's gonna be bright Just stand as a champion Don't let the wave shake you Stand for my strong, I say there is hope, hope is that for There is hope you. for you and me. There is hope, there is hope, hope is that for, for all the women you. in the world. There is hope, all the children. Hope is that for oh, you. There is hope, there is hope, there is hope, hope is that for you. Thank you. And the last song that we're going to perform. It's just like one song, it's for three minutes. The song is called Peace. Tulu mishe amani hiliyokati etu Kitu kim oja Harmony, peace, love So we need a round Equality, harmony, peace, love So we need a round La 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 One love This is not turning to good Flesh and blood. Utu, ujitamini, utamini we. Gu, the 
and flesh and blood. Utu, ujithamini, uthamini we. Shoni moja, tuwa kitu kimoja Sauti moja, ay Tuwa che ukabila, tuungane sote Stop sexual violence Sulu wisho ni moja, tuwa kitu kimoja Sauti moja, ay Tuwa che ukabila, tuungane sote Stop sexual violence Thamini we, thamini we Thamini we Baba we, uthamini we, uthamini we, Baba we, uthamini. Ah, sulu wisho sio bunduki, mapanga na miku kusta basa mkuwa na chuki. Nikiangu kani nuwe niki dondo kani pango se wala sini chukia wala sini zungu. Chacha lo pe mumda lo plus de boulat kambato kontri la violence sexua protéger les femmes et les enfants soyons zini comme les États-Unis l'union fait la force avec la haine et la violence il n'y a que la perdition et des divisions le fond violé les enfants tués ayant pitié des femmes et des enfants soyons le peuple uni par l'amour tenons nous la main dans la main united we stand divided that we fall, stop on the violence, forever peace Africa, stop on the violence, yeah, stop on the violence, Thamini we, Baba we, Thamini we, Thamini we, Mama we, Sam flesh and blood. Utu, Peace to everyone. Peace. Thank you. We can't think of a better way to have hope for our future. I wanted to offer in this section, I'd originally wanted to pay tribute to all of the men who honor women. For without their support, their courage, the risks that they take, our struggle to find ourselves and to overcome the tragedies that befall women in conflict would be very difficult. And originally, I had wanted to introduce us to two young boys, now young men, who were respectively eight and ten when the Rwandan genocide happened. One a Tutsi and one a Hutu, to share how both of them came to terms with what happened. But instead, what I'm going to do, since we had this beautiful offering by our singers, is simply offer one piece in French which combines for me the love and courage of men, the love and hope in our future and in our children. And I know and hope that there are people in this room, I know that there is a member of parliament from Rwanda here who is francophone. Alors, ce morceau est offert à vous tous um, et à vous toutes. Merci. And it's called The Guide at the Genocide Memorial. Le guide au mémorial du génocide. C'est là mon guide au mémorial pour le génocide m'a saisi par l'épaule. 
c'est là. Il m'a poussé, il m'a poussé si fort avec mon enfant sur le dos que je pensais que j'allais tomber sur cette falaise. Quand ils ont essayé de me prendre par le bras, ils, ont, ils les ont agressés, il a dit, non, pas elle, regardez, elle est Hutu, elle n'est pas Tutsi, elle est Hutu comme vous, lâchez-la. Il m'a dit, pars, cours, cours avec notre bébé. Mais je ne voulais pas courir. Comment les laisser, lui, mon mari, nos deux fils, quand je savais qu'ils allaient les tabasser jusqu'à la mort, comme ils les ont fait avec nous tous qui, qui étaient réfugiés ici. Nous habitions tous ensemble sur ces collines. Nous étions tous mélangés comme nos fils. Cours, il m'a dit, cours, sauve-toi, sauve notre fille, fais-le pour moi, fais-le pour nos fils. Alors j'ai couru et je me suis sauvée, moi et ma fille divine. Regarde comme elle est belle, elle a maintenant 15 ans, elle est toujours la première dans sa classe. Je ne saurais pas vous dire laquelle de ces cinquante mille squelettes dans ces salles de classe sont ceux de mon mari et mes enfants. Mais je viens ici tous les matins et j'ouvre toutes les portes, les unes après les autres, et je les appelle. Célestin, mon amour, tu es là Don de Dieu, mon grand, est-ce que c'est toi Favori, mon tout petit, réponds-moi. Ils sont là. Je veille sur eux, comme je veille sur ma fille divine. Jamais je vous quitterai. Jamais je quitterai cet endroit où vous vous reposez. We have reached the very last part of our program, supporting voices of witness and rising women And before Mira has to leave us for the next program, which fortunately brought her to town because she helped organize it, she will give us one more piece. Welcome, Mira. To my mother who I longed for all my life To my father and his sacrifice To the ones who didn't make it past the lies And to those who let go I wanted them to know, wanted them to know I wanted them to know I'm alive To the boys who have forgotten what they said Every time they took my heart to bed And to the ones who'll never have my time And to the one who hasn't shown I wanted them to know, wanted them to know I wanted them to know I'm alive And I'll try to be strong, standing up when I'm wrong, keeping up through the years of all my grieving. Who can hold me enough while I'm busy being tough, weaker still for the years of self-deceiving? 
To the people I know wish my dreams come true So they know I am wishing for theirs too I will sing out I will sing out I will sing out Every moment that I get And not let go so everybody knows so, 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 everybody knows I'm alive. Thank you, Mira. Time has sped by, and I will come with my last piece. You would have seen that this concert, this performance, um, is a free one. We really wanted to extend it to everyone who could come. Um, and yet you would have seen in brackets it said, donations welcome. So I simply wanted to say a word about what that meant. And that was that when I am in so-called Western or industrialized or more fortunate countries, um, I give such performances and welcome any donations which would support my peace work in countries in conflict, uh, which would also support the newest initiative that I've been part of launching, which is called Rising Women, rising world, which seeks at the same time to give, to be a voice of witness for women suffering around the world, for enabling them to say as Mira did, I am alive, and for bringing their narratives into the design of the new world that we would all want to see emerge. So after this last piece, I will be inviting our speakers, our special speakers for the dialogue section, to come and join us on the table. Um, I realize we are a little bit past schedule. I'm hoping that flexibility is possible on your part, as well as on the part of the caterers who've planned the reception. But I guess we shall be playing it by ear. So the next piece is called, I Bear Witness. I travel to lands in deep turmoil. I sift the soil soaked in suffering. I gather the wounded one by one in quiet sanctuaries in nature's breasts. I summon their stories with my eyes. I listen with my inner ear until their tears become a balm, until the monster of their grief transforms and lifts and stands them upright, until gold shimmers through their skin. Thank you. We now take a brief pause and invite our speakers to join us on the podium. Thank you.
in the jack hook. Hey, 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 ho. Thank you. So that's the first part of the evening, and it's been quite an evening, uh, evocative, provocative, and very stimulating. Well, thank you very much, Rama. The next part of the evening is a discussion among Ramamani and two very able Winnipeg colleagues that I'm pleased to introduce to you. Starting on your right, Regine King is a member of the social work faculty at the University of Manitoba. She came to Canada from Rwanda. She knows firsthand the devastation of the, of the killings there. And her research focuses on reconciliation and forgiveness after atrocity. On the left, Mary Lou McFedrin teaches human rights and global studies at the University of Winnipeg and is director of Global Colleges Institute for International Women's Rights. She comes to tonight's conversation with a lifetime of work as a lawyer and advocate for disadvantaged groups, both in Canada and in many places around the world. I look forward to this conversation, <clears throat> and it will continue for a short time here on the stage, and then we will adjourn and we'll move out into the lobby and reception, and all of you can join in the conversation over refreshments at that time. Thank you. I, I think I'll, I'm still mic. Yes, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Our real desire was having listened to the music, the testimonies and stories, is to have an inclusive dialogue over here um, about all of the themes that have been raised. So I'm first going to ask our two invited guests to share with us what came up for you from your own deep experiences, in your case, Regine, in your own country, and now as a scholar of peace and reconciliation. And then over to you, Mary Lou, who's worked on this issue so long and hard in so many parts of the world. So what is coming uppermost to you? What are the themes you think we need to reflect on to enrich the debate and the search for solutions? And as Dean said, because we don't want to miss on the chance of mingling in the um, audience, in, in the reception, we would request you to think of what your questions might be, that we might collect them and discuss them there. I turn to you first, Regine. Share with us what's in your mind. Uh, what's on my mind? Uh, I, I am uh, very touched by the different poems and the different places uh, where uh, massive violence has happened, where many people have been decimated, and where the majority of survivors in many places who continue to be women, who suffer a great deal, and then have to survive the conflict, survive the hardships. And uh, for me, I am a witness of the resilient women of Rwanda. Uh, as you were talking, the story that came to my mind was the story of my grandmother. Uh, I will maybe take two, mi five minutes. I can take, talk about her forever. Uh, and then uh, you will tell you a little bit of the work uh, and the power of women uh, in Rwanda. Uh, as I continue to visit and conduct my research there, and as women uh, now are actually given uh, three basic roles, access to inheritance, access to land, and the fight against the domestic violence. So starting with the story of my grandmother, who was a widow at a very early age with many children, including my father, who was a teenager at the time, and lived it through hardships of being a widow, uh, being a new, re independent country, and went through the 94 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, and survived it at the age of 84. <laughs> so the story of my grandmother goes like this. 
uh, when people started uh, uh, actually telling us that our lives were no longer safe, she felt like she was going to be the one to protect us. <laughs> so she summoned us and told us to go to the bushes. And she had a very bad cough. Of course, she was coughing throughout the night, in the cold, in the bushes. And yet, she wanted to make sure that my mother and my, uh, the wife of my uncle who was killed on the first day, our home was attacked, were safe, and their children, including myself, who was an adult. I was born in 67. Hmm. So I was an adult then. Uh, so, but the question was for my grandmother, uh, because my dad was already uh, passed away in 92, uh, she felt like she was the adult to care for whoever was left with her. Uh, so briefly, what I want to say is that at one point when uh, we were informed that we were all going to be killed and they would leave her alone, so that they can, she can be the symbol of Tutsi in Rwanda at 84, without the children, without the grandchildren. She didn't give up. So she kept running around, looking for food for us, protecting the destroyed homes. And I was very happy that even after the genocide, she continued to be resilient and to see me getting married. And in her optimism, she told me, next time you come to visit, I will not be here, but I will meet you in heaven. <laughs> that was my grandmother. She never gave up. She never gave up until the last day of her life. But the many stories I know of women in Rwanda, uh, for me started after 94, when I worked with a program which was introduced at World Vision, which is known now as the Healing of Life Wounds. After 94, it was introduced by a guy, a Rwandan man, who was a refugee in the Congo and then in Belgium since the 60s. And when he saw the genocide, he decided to return uh, to help the Hutu and the Tutsi come together for mutual healing. So I came across the program, became the first participant uh, of the people he was training in the community, and the, the program brought together the Hutu and the Tutsi right after 94. I have seen the majority of women in those programs, in the program, as I facilitated them. I have seen women coming to attend the workshops uh, without remembering how to brush their hair, without remembering how to coordinate their dresses. In Rwanda, they dress up, by the way. <laughs> and uh, those women were very down. And I have seen them going back and coming back and saying that, why don't we accept to cry? And you will see the horror room cry. And then they will say, now, now as we have shaken it off, can we dance? Hmm. And they will dance and they hug each other and make commitments to become aunts for young women who had lost parents and their own biological aunts, uh, accepting to become godmothers for those who needed to, be get, to get married, uh, going home, making bracelets, uh, getting engaged. So I continue to work with women in Rwanda. So the story can go on and on, but one last one uh, is of a young woman who was uh, only 10 years of age in 94. And when I met her in 2010, when I went to Rwanda to do my uh, dissertation research, I met, she was very small and she had a child on her back. And when I asked her what a life has been after the genocide, uh, she told me that Rwanda has fallen upon her. Hmm. And at the end of this intervention that has become my life of work, uh, she told me, now when I am alone, when I see my, my son growing without a father, 
she's a single mother. Uh, when I see neighbors looking at me with a very bad eye, I will remember that when I joined the Hearing of Life Wounds program, I saw people to whom I can be accountable to. I saw people I can go to when I need help. I saw people I can trust and share my stories. I want to stop here. Mm, thank you so uh, Thank you. Thank you, Regine. You really brought it home by going deep into the work that you've done to heal the wounds in your country. Thank you. Yes. Mary Lou. Thank you so much, Rama, and uh, thank you for the acknowledgement that we are on Treaty One lands and for the acknowledgement that the struggles that occur in Canada are shared throughout the world. I guess I mostly am going to comment from the perspective of being a lawyer and uh, to say that the strongest message that we've had this evening has been about resilience, has been about personal strength and community strength. And I agree that that is the core. I also, though, think that we need to look at the structures and the systems that perpetuate war. We need to appreciate the qualities of leadership that promote peace. And we need to be honest with ourselves about the vast difference in resources available to those two approaches. And I think that it's very appropriate for us here, all of us here, to consider taking some specific action when we leave here tonight to acknowledge that in just a couple of days, in two days' time, in London, in England, there will be the global summit to end, attempting to end sexual violence and gender violence in conflict. And many of us who are Canadians who've been working on human rights issues and working to counter violence, both here in Canada and also in other countries and particularly in conflict, are very concerned about what our government is likely not to do in England. And there is a campaign, a Canadian campaign, to stop violence and rape in conflict. And that campaign is run actually by the Nobel Women's Initiative, which has been created by women who have won the Nobel Prize, staffed out of Ottawa in Canada. And I, I know that we want to have time together informally in the reception. So I just want to urge everyone to bring together these themes that we've explored here tonight, the personal, the community, the resilience that we all need at that very personal level, but also the accountability and the responsibility mm -hmm. and the need to make deep systemic change and shift the resource allocation and shift the priorities profoundly. So one place to start or to continue, as I'm sure many people here with us this evening have been doing your own work, your own work in this area, but one place to start is to actually look up the Nobel Women's Initiative and the Canadian campaign. And there is a hashtag that can be used for those of you who are inclined to social media. Um, however, I would encourage you not to turn on your mobiles. Mine, mine is off at this point. I'm just reading from an email that I just received yesterday. And it's, it states that a digital postcard has been created. And um, you can go to a blog that is uh, organized by the Women, Peace and Security Network in Canada. And it has a whole social media kit that is designed to influence for this upcoming summit that's starting in London. And you can also send messages to at H-O-N, John Baird. And the message is hashtag time to act. And hashtag Canada's commitment. Mm -hmm. Happy tweeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
I can't resist sharing one other thing uh, on this very note about the campaign to end violence against women, which at least, thank God, after so many years, is beginning to gain international mm -hmm. attention of male leaders as well, which is one of the organizations that I support, the World Future Council. I'm a counselor of the World Future mm -hmm. Council, which so far until last year had focused on mainly issues to do with protecting the environment. Uh, we used to give, an, or we still give an award every year, which we call the Future Justice Award. Mm -hmm. And the idea is not to award an individual or an organization, but the best law, which is not just by all of the criteria established by the International Law Commission, not just good for today, but good for seven generations, as uh, the First Nations people would always insist upon. And last year, the, so we've had biodiversity, we've had forests, uh, Rwanda won the award for forests. Um, and what's beautiful already about the awards is that whereas the organization is a non-governmental organization with very few resources, governments are competing and vying with each other, including rich northern governments, the US, Canada, Australia, to, sh to say, look at our brilliant policies, please give us the award. And sometimes they may win it, but often it's Gambia or uh, Rwanda that wins it. So last year it was on nuclear disarmament. And this year we created a special commission and the award is going to be on ending uh, violence against women, which means that governments, fresh after the summit, will be trying to submit their best bet on their policies and how they will be good for ending violence for future generations. I just had to add yes. that. That's going to be on the 15th of October this year at the Interparliamentary mm -hmm. Union. So some things are being done, and I think your point about balancing the structures, the laws, the policies with the human side of aiding healing uh, of the human spirit is so important. And one looking at our organizer, Dean, to see whether you know our intention had been <laughs> Mm -hmm. to get some voices from the audience. And I don't know if there's any way that we can do that while respecting your queue of five minutes. Um, even if they were to just shout out something from their seats, because we don't have a moving mic, so the mic may not pick up. But if we could just get some sense from some of you here of what this afternoon, this evening was like for you, what moved you, and what might you take away from it? And then I would love our two um, special guests to just respond to that. So if you would be willing, any of you, to call out. Please. And with your name, just your name. The winter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other contributions from the floor? Come on. Yes, please.
Thank you very much. Should we take a couple more? And then I'll hand to the two of you to conclude. Any other comments or contributions from the floor? Yes, please. Laura. Um, oh, sorry, there's one more there. But please go ahead, Laura, and then I will call the lady. Christine. Christine? Jane. Jane. I think it's Jane. I think Although it's Jane. I am an academic, I'm going to talk a little bit about feelings. Um, I think that there's a lot of Thank you very much. And there's one lady there, please. Just give us your name as well. Thank you very much. Could I just ask which country you're from originally? Which country are you from originally? Oh, I'm from Kenya. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Beautiful. Could we take one more? There's just one. Oh, that's wonderful, Sylvie. I was just going to ask the Bahati sisters whether you might want to share what this was like for you. Sylvie.
Thank you so much, Sylvie. The generosity of the four of you to just immediately accept our invitation and come and share this glory that gives us such hope is very beautiful. And thanks to you as well, I must say I want to share my enormous admiration for Manitoba. Um, many of the parts of the world I go to, including the country I live in, in France, uh, are so inhospitable to refugees. And I'm just traveling next week to Turkey to meet with Syrian refugees and also in Jordan and in Lebanon. And when you see that there, they've accepted one million refugees when their own population is four million and not close their borders and not put them in camps and not let them drown at sea or in the desert. And we see what our countries do despite the wealth. It's beautiful that there is this haven where people of different nationalities and backgrounds who've gone through such terrible things can feel that there is a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. And in our class, we also evoke that it's right here in our backyard, that Manitoba is this welcoming place, but there's a lot of violence that the indigenous community and indigenous women are experiencing. And it was a great education for me to learn from our First Nation uh, members here of how they are dealing with that with such courage, but also with what you said, demanding accountability. Mm -hmm. But I didn't mean to respond to that, so I just give two minutes to each of you to have the last word, and then we will obey Dean and welcome <laughs> you all to the reception for the continuation of our dialogue. Rishin. Uh, one word that is very difficult to think about after violence, after people have been uh, greatly offended, is to hear the word forgiveness. Uh, when I started working with uh, Hutu and Tutsi after the genocide, uh, if you talk to the issues of the Hutus, the Tutsi will just be against you. <laughs> and if you talk to the issues of the Tutsi, the Hutu will be against you. So in many ways as the facilitators, uh, you were almost like trying to be in between. It was a challenge. And I remember many of the participants uh, saying that they will never come back. We were bad people. We wanted to hurt them more. We wanted to kill them by forcing them to forgive, which was not the purpose because it was like, it's about you and who you are and the things you bring to the setting. Um, but after the second, so there are three sessions. One was about talking about their grief and the different losses, they hated us. The second one was about dealing with emotions. They could hardly wait to come back after mm. hating us so much. And after the second session, they would be the ones actually pushing others to sign up for the workshops, uh, for the session on forgiveness and reconciliation. So I tell people reconciliation, forgiveness is possible. As one participant in my dissertation research stated, he was a young Hutu in 94. He was an adult married with two children in 2010. He stood up and said, before we pretend that we are asking for forgiveness, we should sit on the same bench of learning, of understanding, that suffering is shared, that suffering eats you away, that in order to heal, you need to sit on the same bench of learning, understanding, feeling, understood, and understanding others before you can even dare to ask or give forgiveness. So in Rwanda, it's very possible in many ways because the Hutu and the Tutsi continue to live in the same communities. And as they don't have spaces where they can actually enter dialogue, they continue to isolate themselves. There's actually a very powerful word in the Kenya Rwanda they use that people have become nyamnijendaho, which means minding your own business, mm -hmm. which means that I don't look at you, I don't have to feel your pain, I don't have to think about your problems, and you don't need to know anything about me. But at the end, it's to say, let's stop being in Yamni and be one, and heal one another. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If, if I don't mind. Um, one thing I would add, because I am now seated here with very important people who are the lawyers and uh, people who have worked with NGOs and international organizations, is really to pay attention to what people can do uh, for themselves and come along to support them rather than teaching them what justice is what the peace is and what the forgiveness is. Because as a researcher now, I struggle between what people are to receive and welcome and understand and what they know, but that is never brought to the right of what can inform the laws, the programs, uh, because they do know what they need. Mm. Uh, the question is, how do we support them so that what is in there it will be cheaper, it will be affordable if we can support those mm -hmm. uh, local initiatives where people want to build peace and be peaceful towards an, one another in the places they live, in the mm -hmm. places we mm -hmm. live. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Yeah, very important. A number of the speakers this evening have used the term accountability, and they've used it actually in a number of different ways. What I'd like to do is acknowledge the importance of reconciliation and forgiveness in local communities, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I need to state very clearly this does not mean immunity. This does not mean impunity. And to go back for a moment to the global summit that's about to open, there are Canadians there, and the Stephen Lewis Foundation has a very strong presence uh, with a message that there needs to be a very clear policy change at the UN that there is no immunity for anyone working for the United Nations anywhere, under any circumstances, to be able to commit gender-based sexualized violence and receive immunity or impunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's the perfect note to end on. Uh, the reconciliation and healing, but with absolute accountability and an end to impunity. Mm -hmm. And I also want to acknowledge that this room is filled with people of all backgrounds, colors, and many men. And this partnership, this collaboration between men and women to protect mm -hmm. and cherish and enable women to speak for themselves is what will take us forward. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to WAG, thank you to the Global College, uh, for organizing this event and to the Institute for Women's Studies. And thank you to Rama. So we're not ending, we're just shifting venues out to the foyer uh, for refreshments and time to continue conversation. But before doing that, I simply want to express gratitude and appreciation um, to Winnipeg Art Gallery for partnering with us in this evening, particularly to Anna Weeb and Warren McNeil for their work behind the scenes. Warren. To John and Beatrice Fox for their sharing, welcoming, and blessing, and giving us their music. Mira Black, I think, has already departed for her next engagement this evening, but we certainly appreciated having her here. And a deep appreciation to the Bahatis, Sylvie, Rachel, Francine, and Odette. <laughs> to Regine King, and to Mary Lou McFedrin, 
And Rama, thank you very, very much for making this whole thing happen, for being here, for doing it so well. <clears throat> thank you all for being here, for participating, and a reminder, as Rama said, there is a donation box out there, and if this inspired you, encouraged you, or even depressed you, please feel free to contribute richly. Thank you.